tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 10, Episode 17. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'll be performing three tales to terrify you, courtesy of author Kieran F. West, about vexing visitors, rueful ruts, and testing trials. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first spine-tingling story. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the dare, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. <laughs> this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is brought to you by June's Journey. There's a detective in all of us, friends. Human beings are a curious species. Commensurate with this, we crave mystery, danger, and romance. Our friends at Wooga know that better than anyone, and that's why they brought us June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object murder mystery game set back in the roaring 20s with all its romance, charm, and aesthetic. You and I play as June Parker, amateur detective out to solve a murder, but it's more than just a hidden object game. It's a thrilling adventure through a bygone era with all the mystery and intrigue a detective like you and I could hope for. Love a good whodunit? Here's your first clue. Find your inner detective and download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Blender's Eyewear. Well, friends, it's time to let you in on a very guarded secret of mine. One of my guiltiest pleasures is people watching. The only thing is, no one likes to be stared at or caught staring. Am I right? That's where Blenders comes in. Fresh from San Diego, California, comes the only sunglasses brand I'm ever going to wear again. I'm talking about Blenders Eyewear. I'm confident that you're going to be just as hooked when you see how awesome these shades are. I recently snagged myself a pair of the Seafoam Float 2.0 sunglasses, and I've honestly never worn anything like them. Their sleek design with blue coloring makes me feel cool as a cucumber, even in the summer heat. 
Not only that, but their Float 2 line of sunglasses are the first in their line to float on water. They're perfect to wear when I'm at a ball game, soaking my knee in the hot tub, or yes, even when I'm people watching. Blender's team of in-house designers are constantly coming up with new styles, from orange polarized wraparounds, tortoiseshell frames with purple lenses, to classic gold arms on black lenses, and now their new floating line. Shades so attractive to the eye that you'll be the one people stare at, in awe of your amazing new shades, that is. So avoid those potentially uncomfortable situations and check it out for yourself. Score 15% off your Blunders purchase by visiting BlundersEyewear.com and entering promo code DARKVIP, one word. That's BlundersEyewear.com, code DARKVIP for 15% off. Blunders, rocked with pride worldwide. You know, I like guests, well, to an extent. For instance, every week we certainly invite you in to hear another episode full of freaks, frights, and fun. But eventually, everyone has to go home, right? Guests, uh, they can't stick around forever. Unless, of course, you never bother to ask them to leave. In this tale from Kieran F. West, we invite you into the blissful, charming home of Mr. Bobby Starlin and his family, and whose mysterious guest has bigger plans than simply staying the night. Without further ado, I present to you a welcome guest. My early childhood was spent on my father's farm, in the middle of nowhere. Literally, in the middle of nowhere. We had no hospitals or police stations near us. Everything we ate, we made from scratch. It was like being Amish or something. The farm was called Beacon Farm, and to even get to the store was a long drive in my father's old 4x4. We had a plethora of animals. We had goats, sheep, cows, and pigs. My father managed the slaughterhouse. My mother spent her time making butter, baking bread, and preparing dinner for my father and me. And I often walked the grounds. All day long, I wandered the grounds. It was a fantastic time. My childhood was defined by Beacon Farm. That was until one day, Kenneth arrived. The stability of the farm in my childhood would be defined by the guests that came upon Beacon Farm to take what they felt they were owed. Kenneth stood in the doorway. He was drenched from the rain. He wore a flat cap and he had a big bushy coat on. He smiled despite the drips of rain soaking his face. He seemed happy. He had a warm and amiable nature. Hello, is that Mr. Starlin? It's me, Kenneth, Kenneth said. My father was Bobby Starlin, and my mother was Deidre Starlin. Not many people knew this. Beyond some of the far-to-reach neighbors, the local police and the taxman, strangers didn't know our names, nor did they care. This was a life of family solitude. Kenneth was a rude awakening, a stranger knocking out of the blue, unheard of on Beacon Farm. Uh, may I help you, sir? My father said. My father was a Christian man, not one to turn away a visitor or guest, but wary in the same way a farmer instinctively protects their land. The man put his hand out and said, It's me, Kenneth. May I come in? Kenneth said. And with that, he was within the grounds of our house, drinking a pot of coffee with my folks. I was by the doorway, watching the interaction with naivety and a lack of adult understanding, which is only now heightened by hindsight. I never expected you to remember me, Mr. Starlin, Kenneth said. 
My father nodded sternly. Your mother adopted me. For three years, I lived on Beacon Farm with you. Three long years. I was only ten years old when I lived with you and your parents. You must have been a couple years older. Kenneth kind of said with a laugh and a big wide grin. I'm afraid I don't remember you. Kenneth, is it? My father said. Kenneth looked solemnly. A sadness overtook his face. He looked down onto his shoes. I understand, sir. That is a shame, Kenneth said. Well, is there anything we can do for you? My father asked. I have a small request. I've traveled a long way to see you, and, well, to be honest with you, I'm a little upset that you cannot remember me. But, you see, I walked over 30 miles to get here, sir. I was just wondering if I could stay the night. I'm worried about catching something if I stay in the rain any longer, Kenneth said. My father frowned. My father was not one to welcome a stranger that he'd never met before. I'm sorry, but... I'm afraid I must send you on your way. We don't allow usually for guests, my father said. Kenneth looked at my father and his eyes widened. I am sorry, sir. It is just that I thought you were like a brother to me at that time. That's all, Kenneth said. My father looked confused. This man had come all this way to shake his hand and that was it. What was the purpose of this journey? Oh, honey, we can't turn him away in the rain, my mother said. My father clearly couldn't remember Kenneth at all, but it was true that his mother had fostered and looked after many children on Beacon Farm. My father was the only natural birth to his parents, but his mother's philanthropy made Beacon Farm what it was to that day. My father stood up from his seat. Stay the night, Kenneth. That's not a problem. Join us for dinner. It's delightful to have a former resident of Beacon Farm back again, my father said. During dinner, Kenneth ate like a man that had never eaten before. He was ravenous. He stuffed away plate after plate and then asked for seconds. My mother was delighted to feed such an appreciative man. My father looked on with genuine, frightening concern. You could see the wheels of remembrance calculating within my father's brain. He studied the man intently. That evening, we retired to the lounge, and Kenneth played several games of chess with my father. My father was a brilliant chess player, and could not believe it when Kenneth won game after game after game. Irritated and annoyed at the chess defeats, my father called an end to the evening and went to bed. He requested that Kenneth join us for breakfast before he went on his way. We all went to bed with the stranger in the guest room. The irony of having a guest room and never any guests. As I slept, I could hear the strange mutterings coming from the guest room. The strange utterings and noises. The word master was ringing out from the room and a strange chant, a strange whispered chant. I could hear demented whisperings from within the room. I made it inside, Master. I made it right inside. I will speak to him, Master. I will make him remember what he chose to forget. That next morning, my mother fixed eggs. She put a plate of eggs and bread in front of Kavanath, and he ate with such a rapid gusto and aplomb. I'm happy to give you a ride into town, Kenneth, my father said. Well, that would be amazing, Mr. Starlin, but I was hoping to just stay one extra night until I can get back to full health. I'm still somewhat drowsy from the rain, Kenneth said. My father frowned. His generosity had failed him. This man had arrived from nowhere, eaten his food, slept in his bed, and beaten him at chess in his own house. My father's memory of the man was lost. After all, I came looking for a brother that doesn't remember me, Kenneth said. My father was a gentleman, and something about this guest was eating at my father. You could see it clearly. My father sighed reluctantly. One more night, my father said. 
Thank you, Mr. Starlin, really. Thank you so much, Kenneth said. That evening, as we sat down for dinner, Kenneth leaned close to my father and physically pulled my father's chair closer to him. He did it with a big, threatening smirk on his face. My mother nearly dropped the tray of potatoes. My father looked aghast. Fury took upon his face until Kenneth said, It was a shame about the fire on this land. The one in the barn? Do you remember the fire in the barn, Bobby? My father slumped his shoulders at the word fire. I never knew about a fire on this land. I looked at my mother, and she shrugged her shoulders in equal confusion. What fire? My mother yelled. My father shushed my mother immediately. He looked pleadingly toward Kenneth. It was a tragic shame that they couldn't save all of those children, Kenneth said. My father nodded. My father began to tremble and shake. I saw his leg moving from underneath the table. A profound sense of grief had overcome him and shot his adrenaline to a thousand there and then. I often wonder how the fire started. All those curious little boys you had, curiously exploring the property, and who knows, maybe one of them set fire to the barn, Kenneth said. My father's eyes widened. It was the worst day of my life, my father said. I looked at my mother. The worst day of his life? and we didn't even know about it. A better day for you than all those children in the barn, wouldn't you say, Mr. Starlin? Kenneth said. Children? My mother screeched. My father looked upon the dining table in a stark shame. He refused to beat Kenneth's eyes. Was it you that set the fire to the barn, Mr. Starlin? Kevin asked with a hushed malevolence. Absolutely not, my father said in a loud incredulity. His face reddened and my father's fist was clenched. Good. More pork, please, Kenneth said. And my mother heaped more pork on Kenneth's plate. The sins of the father. Kenneth winked at my father and then at me. Then he smiled at my mother. Delicious. What do you think, Bobby? Kenneth said. The name Bobby was said with a real punch and bite. Kenneth managed to stick around a fair bit after the agreed two nights. Every night, I heard the weird prayers and chants from the guest room. Kenneth shoveled our food into his mouth. He watched our television, spent hours consumed in the bathtub and walking the ground, to the point where my own joyful exploration of the farm was now restricted to the small patch of forest where I'd built a treehouse. Kenneth had successfully conquered and colonized the farm. He was everywhere. Every room I entered had Kenneth in it. Every piece of land was taken by Kenneth's presence. My father became dour at the intruder, but it got to the point where Kenneth was a week in. My father lost any gumption to kick the man out father had readily accepted Kenneth, just like that. I approached my father. The frustration of seeing Kenneth everywhere was pissing me off. I was to broach the subject with him. My dad was in the lounge reading the newspaper, legs crossed, cigarette in his mouth and coffee still steaming on the table. Oh, father, how long has Kenneth gone to live with us? I asked. His son, Kenneth doesn't live with us, he said, but he's here every day, and I miss when it was just the three of us, I said. My father sucked hard on the cigarette and blew it out again. Son, this man pertains to being a brother of mine. My mother took in many children, and I regret that perhaps we owe this man more than you could imagine, for the sake of your grandmother's legacy. You remember your grandmother? He asked. Yes, I said. It's for her, and for me, and for Beacon Farm. The sins of the father are carried on to their children, if you catch my drift, he said. I didn't. I didn't catch any drift. 
Thanks, Father, I said, and I walked out of the room. Nobody in the house could ever sleep anymore. Kenneth was drowning out our evenings with a fearsome chant every single evening. It was a prayer. It was a call. It was a beacon to the afterlife. I'm sorry, but this is ridiculous. I heard my mother scream from the bedroom. I know, sweetie. My father said, Then kick him out, like you said you would, my mother said, far too loud. My father paused. Then the room went quiet. Then the deadly chanting stopped. I held my breath. The ringing of silence went through our ears, echoed throughout the house. And then the chanting began again. He's a guest, my father scowled. At the end of the week, my parents were resigned to the guest room, and Kenneth had taken over the master bed, moving his cap and two sets of clothes with him. I couldn't understand the change in dynamics and hierarchy, but my father was initially the one that Kenneth had spoken up toward on their first meeting. But somewhere during the stay, my father was now answerable to Kenneth, and now Kenneth spoke down toward my father. Something had turned somewhere, and my father was now petrified of Kenneth. I couldn't see where the change occurred, except for when Kenneth mentioned the fire. My parents waited on Kenneth hand over foot. Kenneth was sitting in the kitchen with a knife and fork, banging against the kitchen table, awaiting pile after pile of delicious food that my mother slaved over all day to prepare. I was just a casual observer of this madness, but my parents had begun forsaking the farm for Kenneth. As I sat eating toast, Kenneth poured bacon and eggs and coffee down his throat. I looked upon the palm of his hand, and I saw a luminescent pebble on the very center of the surface, and I saw strange power within the amoeba on his hand. I saw my parents gazing at that thing fearfully saw that Kenneth had power from within the very palm of his hand, and I recoiled in abject fear. Do not fear the pebble, my lad. The pebble means well. The spirit of Penwarden means well, Kenneth said. Who's Penwarden? I asked. Now, let's not bother Kenneth, young man. My father said, and he hoisted me off my seat and ushered me onto the grounds. Smart lad! I heard Kenneth say. Pen Warden was the thing that Kenneth spoke to every night. I came to realize that my parents had gathered an awareness of Pen Warden during their stay. My father recoiled at the mention of his name. Pen Warden was the name I heard Kenneth chant in the now colonized master bedroom. But who this was was beyond my young grasp. But the way I saw it, my father prayed to Jesus, and Kenneth prayed to Penwarden. What was the difference? It was a sudden thing, the way Kenneth had gone from guest to proprietor, but I still tried to see Kenneth as merely an extension to the farm, the same way that the pigs and the cows were a welcome guest and extension to Beacon Farm. I still wandered the grounds and the spaces that Kenneth hadn't occupied. I fed the animals, and I checked on him. I checked to see if they were affected by the strange man with his ugly chance and pebble-shaped power. The animals were fine. My mother and father were slowly losing their strength. My father was a strong, burly man before Kenneth came around. Now he was weakened, severely weakened. He looked like he'd lost nearly 15 pounds within the space of a week. My mother, too, looked gaunt and frail and more demure than I was used to. Kenneth, in the meantime, seemed to be getting fatter and fatter. He was a plump purple color by now. He was often joyous and happy, but with that menacing scowl he aimed toward my father, the one that kept my father in check. Kenneth was changing. Everything was changing. When he first arrived, he was a rakish, tall, weasley. Now he was becoming this big, plump, jovial, loud, roly-poly of a man. The change was rapid, and just as rapidly was my parents' deterioration. 
I decided to ask my father again about Kenneth. He sat in the study after a long day of labor and constantly served our guests. Father, why is Kenneth still here? I asked. Son, you'll now have to get used to the idea of Kenneth, he said. But I don't want to get used to Kenneth. He's ugly and loud, and he smells out the house with his incense. He uses the bathtub all day long. He eats all the food, and he doesn't belong in this house, I screamed. My father slapped me. He gave me a hard slap across the face and rose from his chair. Kenneth is our guest, a welcome guest, he said. And within the doorway was Kenneth, applauding my father, clapping to the act of violence that my father had just carried out. Mr. Starlin knows what loyalty is, young man, Kenneth said to me. He walked towards my father and slapped him upon his bald head. Kenneth kept his hand upon my father's head, tapping his fingers. That wasn't a very nice thing you said about me, boy, Kenneth said. Kenneth raised the palm of his hand toward me, and I saw the beckoning of his pebbled amoeba, and then he slapped me across the face, across the other cheek, the one that my father left untouched. You don't want to become a troublesome fire starter like your father, Kenneth yelled. My father's eyes widened at this insinuation. He looked fearful, more afraid than I'd ever seen anyone in my life. He looked at Kenneth in a pleading manner. Lock this boy in the cupboard, Kenneth said. And my father did. He grabbed me by the hands and threw me into the cupboard and locked the door. And that was where I spent that night. The next day, after my father let me out of the cupboard, Kenneth was extra pleasant to me. At breakfast, I ate my usual toast. While he shoveled down half the farm, he ruffled my hair and smiled slid some bacon onto my plate. When you get to mine and your father's age, you'll understand about discipline. Right, lad? Kenneth said. I ate some of the bacon. I was so hungry. Two bites, and it was gone. And if you become a good boy, I'll introduce you to my friend, Ben Warden, Kenneth said. Father? Who is Ben Warden? I asked. My father dropped a plate and it smashed onto the floor. Kenneth rose from the dining room table and screamed at my father. Clean that up! Clean that up! You clean that up, or I swear to God! My father ran to the utility drum, and pulled out the dustpan and brush, and was rapidly sweeping up the broken plate and bits of bacon on the kitchen floor. Call yourself a farmer. I call you a pig. Kenneth said in disgust. My mother ran out of the room crying. I was gassed. I had never seen my father spoken to this way. I'd never seen my mother crying. I'd never seen the vicious tonal temper of Kenneth. I wanted out of the farm. I wanted away from this nightmare scenario that I'd fallen into. I wanted the blissful nature of my earlier days. I wanted Kenneth gone. As I exited the kitchen and walked upstairs to my room, I saw my mother. She was desperately crying on the landing floor by the foot of the stairs. Her dress was ripped, and you could see the ribs attaching themselves to my mother's skin. Both my parents were withering away, physically and emotionally, and I was too. One evening, I mustered up the courage to approach Kenneth in my parents' old room. I knocked on the door. I couldn't take this anymore. I'd have to assert myself as man of the house. My father was losing that right. I waited for him to call me in or to tell me to piss off. Is that you, young man? He said. Yes, I said through the door. Enter, he said. As I entered, I saw Kenneth in the middle of the room. He wore just his shorts. He was shirtless and covered in a black smudge of paint. He sat atop newspaper clippings, his hands clasped together, and his eyes closed. Hello, he said. Hello, I said. I mean no disrespect, but for how long do you intend to stay here, sir? I said.
Call me old-fashioned. But today's milieu just doesn't do it for me. While you kids are home playing Dance Revolution, I'm out cutting the rug at the Blind Tiger. While you're all Netflix and chilling with your avocado toast and tofu nuggets, I'm dressed to the nines at the cinema watching the latest talkie flick. While all you youngsters are trying to find your way, looking for some meaning to cling to in our decaying civilization, me, I've got a greater calling. I'm collecting clues, lifting prints, bagging evidence, sleuthing about. That's right, I'm a 1920s detective. And if that sounds glamorous to you, I've got news, good news. We're hiring. Just download June's Journey for free on the App Store or Google Play, and you can start right away. June's Journey is a murder mystery game set back in the Roaring Twenties. You and I play the part of June Parker, amateur detective and certified hotsy totsy hot on the trail of a murderer. You'll scrutinize thousands of intricately crafted scenes from all over the world, collecting clues and cracking cases from New York City to Paris, France. One of my favorite things about June's journey is the atmosphere. The scenery really sucks you in, and with more and more cases added each week, there are always new ones to explore. The detective business is booming, folks. There's always a case to crack. Now, I'm not going to tell you I play June's journey all the time. I do take breaks every once in a while. I'll occasionally stop playing June's journey to record a June's Journey commercial, for instance. Other than that, I'm basically full-time. I'll play in the morning for a pick-me-up, and at night to wind down. The gameplay is engrossing and relaxing, nothing like the typical shoot 'em ups you youngsters are into. There's danger, there's drama, but there's also brain work. As a detective, your powers of recall and observation will be put to the test. So give your thumbs a little break and fire up the old noodle, just like they did in the old days. So sure, you can call me old-fashioned if you want to, but you'll never make your own light shine brighter by extinguishing mine. In fact, you'll never extinguish mine, not with that little pea shooter of yours. Instead, I challenge you to play at least chapter two. See if you're not an old soul yourself, 30 million June's Journey fans can't all be wrong, you know. So unleash your inner Sherlock, listener. Remember, there's a detective in all of us. Find your inner detective. Download June's Journey free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Thanks for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Blender's Eyewear. Let me tell you a little more about the company we talked about earlier. Chase Fisher started Blender's by selling his beachy shades out of a backpack while doubling as a surf instructor on Pacific Beach. His main goal, to create an adventurous mid-priced option for eyewear with the same cool factor as other leading styles. And fortunately, unlike expensive big brand shades that you've probably lost or smashed in the past, blenders are actually affordable. So you're not going to cry as much when the inevitable happens. And with my new Float 2 O's, I needn't worry if a wave knocks them into the ocean or having them slip off my face with every dive into the water. Yep, blenders offers a line of sunglasses with a variety of styles and colors that actually float on water. Look out, Lazy Rivers, I'm coming for you. Also, on a more serious note, our eye care is one of the most important aspects of your life. In fact, there's a good chance you've suffered from headaches due to working with bright screens and low lighting. The night brings peace and quiet, two things absolutely necessary for my line of work. But the headaches due to bright screens and eye strain can be pretty hard to handle. That's why I was more than thrilled to find the relief only blue light-filtered glasses could achieve. 
That's right, they don't offer just sunglasses. Blenders has a variety of prescription glasses, readers, and blue lights, as well as a snow collection with goggles and accessories. Live life in forward motion with Blenders today. Score 15% off your Blenders purchase by visiting BlendersEyewear.com and entering promo code DARKVIP. One word. That's BlendersEyewear.com. Code DARKVIP for 15% off. Blenders. Rocked with pride worldwide. Until I'm called to leave, he said. He opened his eyes, and I saw a luminescent glow between his blue-colored iris and the pupil. It was the color of street lights. Why are you here? I asked. I'm a guest, he said. No, you're not, I said. I'm a guest. I was invited, he said. No, you just appeared one day, and you won't leave. I liked it when it was just me, my father, and mother, I said. I was frustrated. I was angry. My voice rose as I said these words. I wanted to slap this evil man and cast out his evil ways, but I was held back by my childhood and the weakness of my pre-adolescence. Kenneth shrugged and closed his beaming eyes again. Your father expected my arrival, Kenneth said. No, he didn't, I screamed. I looked toward the door and my frail, weakened father stood behind the door. He gave me a look of frightful disappointment, like I was in the wrong. Your father expected me. He's been expecting me for some time, Kenneth said. I looked upward toward my father. Son, leave Mr. Kenneth alone. Do not disturb him, my father said. Why did you let this man into our house? Why have you not called the police and kicked him out? Why are you feeding him every day? Why do you let him walk through the grounds of the house, causing such a disturbance? Why are you not man enough to protect your family? I said to my father. Kenneth is a guest, son. We do not treat guests this way, my father said, the timid shake in his voice noticeable. He's not a guest. He's an intruder, I shouted. Son, you're being quite rude to Kenneth, my father said. I stormed out of the room and barged toward my father and went back into my bedroom through the covers of my head. From the distance of the master bedroom, I could hear Kenneth lambasting my father some more. I could hear the slaps and hits and the harsh words of brutal domination. Kenneth was now in charge of Beacon Farm. Kenneth became more demanding and more physically domineering. He'd throw his coffee over my parents and he'd slap my father around the head if there were anything he didn't like about what he was eating or what my father was doing. My mother stayed in the guest room, hidden away from Kenneth. She seemed accepting of the situation and just awaited the final stage, whatever Kenneth chose that to be. She'd accepted defeat. She'd often swayed back and forth in the bed and repeated the phrase, This was your father's sin, not mine. Why am I being punished? I tried to imagine that Kenneth had other families to torment and that he wouldn't be around forever, and so I decided to just go about my own business in my own way until this nightmare ended. And then Cliff arrived. Cliff also turned up in the middle of the night, soaked in rain, smiling with his hat in his hand, pleadingly asking for a seat at the table. Hello, Cliff, Kenneth said. Hello, Kenneth, Cliff said. Do you mind if I join you for dinner, Cliff said? This is the Starlin house. They'll have to ask the patriarch, Mr. Starlin. Do you remember Cliff? Kenneth asked my father. I'm afraid I do not, my father said. He lived in the house. He was another castaway saved by your gracious, kind mother, Kenneth said. My father lowered his head. You were like a brother to me, Mr. Starlin, Cliff said. Kenneth chuckled, slapped that growing belly of his, and ate some more strings of bacon. That's what they all say, Kenneth said. 
Cliff raised his hand in submission, and he demonstrated the same pebble on his palm, the same one that Kenneth had. Please join us, my father said. I punched the table in anger. There was to be another freak taking up the grounds in my house. Is this what your mother did, father? Took any filth man off the street and onto her farm? Is this what the farm was and has become again? I shouted at my father. Now that's not the way to welcome a guest in this house, Kenneth said. Screw you, I shouted toward Kenneth. A great gasp rose from the table by everyone concerned. The table went deathly silent. Everybody was stunned at the provocation. The table halted into a portrait of complete silence. I got up and left the table. Such insolence, Cliff remarked. That evening I dreamed of the clearest of pictures I'd ever dreamed of in my life. Clear enough to have been a film or TV show that I could remember as vividly as pictures in a book. The scene still sticks with me like scenes from a movie screen. It started when I was round the back of the barn and I had in my hands a pack of matches. I could feel the flint all coarse between my fingers. It was an old barn, not the current barn that we had. It was a decaying wooden barn. It was old and dirtied. The barn was full of children within. They were playing. The barn was being used as a play center for the children. There were hula hoops and hopscotch markings. Little kids slapped their hands together and sang songs in a delightful glee. I looked down at the matches. It was a full pack. I'd never played with matches before. I was thrilled at the potential of the match. The potential to do life-changing things the strike of one match. Bobby, what are you up to around here? A voice said. I turned and I faced a woman that looked like my granny, but much, much younger. I'm not Bobby, I said. I slid the matches into my pocket and hoped that they weren't noticed by this kind woman. Now, Bobby, knock off the silly games, she said with a smile. But I'm not Bobby, I said. She patted my head and walked away. A trail of foggy clouds seemed to follow her as she walked off, her silky dress caressing the floor of the grass. I ran towards the horse's stable. We don't have horses now. It seemed that we did then. I took a large bale of hay and ran back to the barn. I placed it outside the barn, but I stacked it up within the wooden frames. I stuffed the hay in. My fingers and nails were all dirty and sodden. I don't know what compelled me to do this. I wasn't within reach of my reason or logic. Hey, what are you doing? I heard someone say. I looked and saw a young man facing me. He was curious. He was interested. He was eager to know what I was doing. Not in an accusatory manner, but in a befriending and kindly manner. Who are you? I asked. You know me, the boy said. No, I don't, I said. I'm a foster child. I'm Penwarden. Your mother's looking after me, Penwarden said. I hate all of you foster kids. I want the farm to be the way it was. I hate that you all come here like a bunch of slugs and eat my food and sleep on our floors, and you're all lazy and don't help around the house properly. I hate all you foster kids, I said to the boy. A tear started to trickle down his cheek. Oh, look. The foster boy is crying. The foster boy who can't have his own mommy and daddy, I shouted. The boy started to run away and I gave choice. I wanted him to get the full brunt of my anger. I jumped on top of his back. We both fell down and I was on top of this boy started putting hay into his mouth. I put his arm around his back to the point of it nearly breaking, and when he screamed, I gave him a few kicks. You're not welcome in this house, I shouted between each kick. When I released my grip, the boy ran away. I returned to peeking through the holes within the barn. I saw all the children there, all of the children that my mother was so eager to house. 
children slept in sleeping bags across the grounds to the point of ridiculousness. The noisy kids were always clamoring through the halls and the walls of the house. And then I lit the box of matches and threw them upon the hay. I watched the flames start slowly and then gather speed as the wind caught the small trickle of flame. And the flames began to double, triple, maximizing in height and ferocity, and then really catch on against the side of the barn. Rising and rising and rising up toward the roof of the barn. And then I heard the screams with and I ran back toward the house, back towards Granny. All the kids within the barn had charred or were near death. The farm was then awash with police, firemen, paramedics, and inquisitive neighbors. It had all happened so fast. Time had no resonance beyond the rapidity of passing. The woman, Granny, I assume, had sat me down. Her face streamed with tears the despair in her face was gargantuan. It was inconsolable grief. Bobby, what happened by the barn? She asked. I keep telling you I'm not Bobby, I said. She slapped me. She slapped me hard and let all her frustration travel through the slap. Now is not the time for games, Bobby, she screamed. An instinct took over me, and my instinct was to avoid danger or trouble to deflect the blame, to pass through any consequences, to stick it to one of those damn foster kids. I saw Penwarden playing with matches and stuffing the hay into the barn, I said. Oh, Lord, she cried. Then I looked over at fat, ugly orphan Penwarden, and I gave him the finger. He looked at me confused, still hurting from earlier. It's bad news, Ma, I said to my granny, and then I hugged her. And she clung back to me. Just glad you're okay, she said. I stepped outside and saw the charred remains of the children. Their blackened bodies were still steaming with smoke. They were laid out on the grass, and the policeman was writing down names in a notebook. Samuel, Cliff, Christopher. And then I saw Penwarden being taken away by three policemen, a delicate hand atop his shoulder. A sorrowful look upon his face. Oh, Lord, my granny screamed. She wailed like a wounded wolf and then sunk to the floor on her knees. Then I was in an older body, even older than I am now. I was walking the halls of what appeared to be a hospital, but all the cells were padded with cushions amongst the walls. The hallways were long and thin. I held a piece of paper with some writing on it. I looked down and I saw the words, Patient Penwarden, cell 35A. A young woman stood facing me. She wore a blue hospital gown and a beautiful smile with her hair tied back in pigtails. This one is loco. It's your turn to check on him, she said. Who? I asked. Penwarden, of course, she said. Who's Penwarden, I asked. Kenneth, knock it off, she said. Who's Kenneth? I asked. As I approached the far end of the hallway, I heard the malevolent chuckling from within the walls of the cells. I walked further and further down a long, cascading hallway until I approached cell 35A with the word Penwarden scribbled in chalk across the black door. I turned the knob of the door and I entered. I saw an older, deranged-looking Penwarden seated at the center table within his padded cell with his palms open. And I saw that familiar pebble that had conquered the center of his palm. And I walked closer and closer towards that enticing beam of white. You owe me a favor, Penwarden said. A ratcheting noise. Those awful chants were hollowing out in my head. The same chants that Kenneth did every night, except I was now Kenneth. Then I woke up. Kenneth stood over me as I awoke. He laughed. He smiled, and I saw the bright white of his horse-toothed smile. Sins of the father, Kenneth said. The house was changing upon the entry of our new guests. The house was becoming more fluid, and there was a strange, 
swaying movement in the house and everything within it, almost like it was moving in tandem with the winds. The colors, which I can remember as being a blue and white motif before then, developed into a red and black entanglement of rich noir. The guests were getting fatter, but the original occupants, beside myself, were becoming frailer and skinnier. I was the only thing within the house that hadn't changed. It was like they were eating the contents of the house and draining the power away from the owners. Pretty soon my parents couldn't keep up with their demands for food, and Kenneth and Cliff began eating the livestock whole. They'd march a pig or cow into the kitchen, stun it with one of the stun guns, and then begin devouring the flesh the way you'd see a lion or tiger do it in a nature documentary. Then they'd leave my parents to clean up the discarded carcass of their beloved livestock. I was stuck to my toast. We had enough frozen bread that I could live off the toast and eat this every day. My parents lived off nothing and it showed. The weakened, starved, malnourished state of my parents was a depressingly familiar sight by that point. I'd lost track of how long Kenneth had been there, and now Cliff was here, and then another guest. A visitor turned up. Another guest. Once again, on a rainy evening, a knock on the door. Hello, I'm Christopher, Christopher said. Covered in rain, drenched head to toe in the rainy rural wet from the journey. Why, well, hello, Christopher, I'm Kenneth, Kenneth said. I was wondering if I may stay with you this fine evening, Christopher said. Well, I'm afraid it's not for me to give out invitations willy-nilly on this farm. This house belongs to Mr. Bobby Starlin, Kenneth said. Cliff... Christopher, Kenneth, my mother, and myself looked upon my father. My father, drained of all essence, shrugged his shoulder and said, Please join us, Christopher. My mother ran to the fields to get another animal to bring to the house. Kenneth sat at the table with the stun gun dangling between his fingers. After dinner, the floor was caked in blood. The floor had turned a crimson red through standing and my father started putting down pieces of newspaper across all of the floors, in all of the rooms. Blood was everywhere. Footsteps of animal blood in every single room. A harsh whiff of iron wherever you went in the house. Whenever Kenneth finished his meal of raw animals, he'd toss the bone on the floor and say, a sacrifice to Penwarden himself, followed by the chant of Penwarden, Penwarden. And warden. The blood and waste would seep into the floor and emanate from every room throughout the house. The walls were covered in animal waste and half-eaten carcasses. After Cliff and Christopher, we were then joined by Donald, Reuben, Marcus, Paul, Samuel, and Timothy. The house was full now, packed to the rafters. A collection of strange men now occupying every crevice of the house. And the house itself had become trashed with blood, animal guts, and the collective waste of the unwanted and unwelcome guests. The house had taken on the full form of black and red, and that brownish tinge of wastage. And then one day we ran out of animals. They were all disposed of. All of them. I wandered down onto the fields of the grounds and saw that we didn't have a single animal left. They were all gone. The years and generations of work throughout the Starlin family had now gone to waste. They'd been consumed by the waste. The grass had turned barren, and the farm had a vacancy to it that was depressing, alarming, and somewhat felt inevitable. I walked back into the kitchen and saw the dining room full of guests. They smiled at me, they laughed and cajoled. My father and mother were desperately sweeping up and cleaning up around these vermin. We have no animals left, I said. The kitchen broke out in cheer and laughter. There was applause. We've emptied the contents of the farm, Kenneth said. There was more cheer and applause. I think that means you should go now. 
spoke and it smiled. The room went quiet, and then he looked upon the other guests and everybody cheered again. We've exited phase one, Kenneth said. Everybody cheered. Please, leave us with what we have left of the farm and just go. I said, I'm afraid we cannot leave you with the farm, Kenneth said. But what will you eat, I said. When we run out of livestock, we begin consuming the house, Kenneth said. And he wasn't joking. They were not consuming the house from within. Like termites, this collective of men was now ravishing between the walls of the house. They took little nibbles out of the upholstery. They took big bites out of the bathtub. They were literally eating the house from within. For the next five days, while I feasted on toast, and my parents' bodies feasted on themselves, the guests of the house were literally feasting on the house. I walked through the halls of my grandchildhood home, and I'd see chunks taken from the walls, the huge holes with teeth marks surrounding it. I'd see the decay and crumble from within the house. The house was at the point of teetering over, and I knew I had to do something to get rid of the guests. It dawned on me what the guests were doing. They were going to consume everything on the farm, literally everything. They were like a parasitic virus, taking every drop from the farm, and that would include ourselves. There was only one way out. Dad, I said. I never called him Dad, ever. But that day, I called him Dad. It was the middle of the night. My mother was asleep. The vermin were asleep. Loud snores echoed throughout the house. Dad, I said again. My father awoke. Yes, son, he said. I know why Kenneth came, I said. Why's that, son, he asked. When you were a child, maybe my age, maybe older, maybe younger, I don't know. But I know that you killed all of those kids in the barn, I said. My father weakly mumbled an incoherent acknowledgement of my words. You killed all those children. You burned the barn down, I said. My father nodded, and then you blamed the Penwarden boy for doing it. This is your retribution. This is vengeance for the kid and for Penwarden, I said. How did you know this? My father asked. I don't know. Maybe through Kenneth, maybe through the house itself. But I saw what happened. I saw it. It was you, I said. He's come to claim what I took from him, my father said. What did you take from him, I asked. His home, the farm. His place as a guest on the farm, my father said. Kenneth, I said. He was in the barn on the day that it burned. They all were. I took them from my mother's charity. They've come to take the farm back, and to be honest, they deserve the farm, he said. Why'd you burn the barn, I asked. Malicious spite. I don't like having guests on this farm. I didn't want to share my mother's love, my father said. But what you did, it was, I said. Unforgivable, my father concluded. He's making you suffer, I said. I deserve to suffer. He's making the house and the farm suffer. And he's making you suffer. You don't deserve this, my father said. I forgive you, Dad, I said. My father looked at me. He was pleased. It was the first smile that I'd seen from him in God knows how long. Be the man of the house, he said. How so, I asked. Don't be a coward like me. Accept your responsibilities and end this. You can end this now, he said. How do I end this, I asked. It ends with me, he said. I pondered the meaning, and then it dawned on me that this was my father's sin. This was my father's punishment. Phase one was eating our livestock. Phase two was eating our house. Phase three would end with consuming us. 
us. I picked up the pillow that he lay on and I put it over his face. And I began to suffocate my father within the pillow. He fought for a moment. He struggled and kicked and writhed in his body. But I put all my young strength behind the pillow. And I was fighting a weak and frail man. And then he stopped, and the body turned lifeless. No, 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 no! Kenneth yelled. He ran towards me and pulled me off of the pillow and threw me into the corner of the room. He looked down upon the bed and saw that my father was dead and beyond the realm of this life. You little bastard! This wasn't how this was meant to go! Kenneth screamed. Kenneth ran towards me and grabbed me by the collar. I saw my half-asleep mother rise from consciousness and screech upon the realization that my father was dead. Kenneth held me up against the wall and was crashing my head against it. Crash! 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 Against the wall. If you kill Mr. Starlin, then we will no longer be welcome guests within the house, Kenneth said between every hit of my skull. I've killed Mr. Starlin, I said. I tried to get air. I tried to say what I wanted to say, to make my words as impactful as possible. But he continued to choke me. And then Cliff put a hand upon Kenneth's shoulder. Let the boy go, Kenneth, Cliff said. But he's ruined everything, Kenneth said. Mr. Starling is dead. Let the boy go, Cliff said. The other occupants clambered into the room. Kenneth scurried into the corner like the rat he was, and wept in that corner. I am afraid, with the father dead, we're no longer welcome guests of this house. We have to leave, Cliff said. I coughed and choked, and I tried to gather as much air as possible to keep me from falling into unconsciousness. I spluttered, and a wad of blood came out of my mouth and hit the floor gathered for air, and I said, With my father dead, I can no longer retaliate for what he did. But then it dawned on me what killing my father did. It ended it. It ended the haunting. They came to this house because of what he did to the barn that day, long ago in his younger years. They were the children of the barn. With my father dead, the score had now been settled, they could no longer devour the house and torture his family. They are no longer welcome guests of this farm. They all left together. They walked down the stairs in unison and out the door and slammed it behind them. In the red and black of the interior, it started to soften. The house had been cleared of all of them. I looked up at my mother. She was trying to regain her strength so that she could stand on her own two feet. I looked at my father. His body was limp, his face upward, a dead stare across the ceiling. His mouth was open. It was his transgression that caused such a disturbing time. The guilt and shame must have wrecked my father throughout his entire life, and now he could hopefully get some peace. Afterwards, we buried my father in the ground the very same grounds where countless generations of starlings had built a magnificent farm. The police never questioned where he went, and if anybody within the region ever asked, we said that he went out for a pack of cigarettes and never came back. Nobody cared about us or our family enough to look into it. I won't get into the story of my mother's guilt, grief, or sorrow, but she's doing fine now and she's living safely with me. My mother sold the house eventually, but the house was so destroyed that it was more the land that was purchased. The land sold handsomely, but the house was immediately knocked down because it was beyond any repair. My father cursed the house when he did what he did to those children. I learned the full story and it was very simple. My father had set fire to the barn and then blamed it on the orphan child, Penwarden. Penwarden was committed for his crime and then killed himself in an asylum, hanging with his own bedsheets. The men that visited were never seen again, but they prayed to Penwarden. 
And I assume that through some otherworldly contact, this was Penwarden's ambush and Penwarden's revenge. When my father died, the vendetta died, and the house could no longer go on being tormented. And neither would we go on with the torment. It ended with my father. But one thing that I can't explain to this day, many years later, was what was the pebble that enraptured everyone, the pebble on the palm of the hand, the one that Kenneth had and Penwarden had in my dream, and that I now have and have had for many years. I've consulted a doctor about this. I've spoke to a soothsayer. I spoke to a psychic, and I've posted on the internet for answers that I cannot explain what it is. But I have one now. A large radiating pebble is embedded within my right hand. A lingering hangover from what happened at Beacon Farm. And I hate what it sometimes calls me to do because it's a bad, bad influence. I hope you enjoyed A Welcome Guest by Kieran F. West, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Kieran dash F dash West. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash K I E R A N dash F dash W E S T. From there, take a gander at his site, flashfear.com where you can read his collection of short-form horror. If you do decide to stop by the profile, please leave Kieran a kind word and let him know you heard about him here on this show and that me, Otis Jiry, sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring Twice the Terror, Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry Channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>
Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>